Hey, how you guys doing? So it's Pastor Dave here. We're going to be recording our Zoom lessons for Head to Heart. So this is actually for, let's see, what's tomorrow? Tomorrow is October. No, it's not October. Where did I get that? It's September. September 23rd. So uh, I've got a little video clip. Uh, it's about three minutes long for you. I'd like you to watch that, and then we'll come back, and we'll chat about that and some other things uh, in just a few minutes. See you on the flip side. Everything begins and ends in the darkness. But God said, it is our job in this life to find our way to the light. They're a great family. Uh, they were wonderful except me. <laughs> well, you turned out all right. <laughs> As a child, well, I got most of my running, running from the cops. Being a juvenile delinquent, I was always surviving. Someone down there? Who's down there? Just I couldn't conform to family life, so I was always in trouble. Come on, faster. Why? No one's chasing me. This is so dumb. My brother got a hold of me at just the right time. I can't make a track team. I didn't even know why you Yes, you me can. To... If you could take it, you can make it. And I made up my mind, I'm going to go all out to be a runner. That's one thing you learn in sports, is you don't give up. You, know, you fight to the finish. And that's important in the war, too. Hey, Dave, hey, Dave. we are going down. The determination to come out first, come out alive. <gasps> this story is so big. You could go on and on and on because he lived so many lives. It's not just about athleticism and being resilient, but it's also about friendship and love and loyalty and family and faith. And one of the things that became clear to me is his life wasn't lived in chapters, that these themes tracked through his whole life. Where was faith when he was eight? He was watching his mom pray on her knees. He was going to church trying to figure out what that meant. You know, where was faith when they were stuck in the raft? If you get me through this, I swear I'll dedicate my whole life to you. It evolves, and, and what kind of abuse was he suffering when he was eight? What kind of abuse was he suffering when he was 24? I'm gonna kill him. That's not how we beat him. We beat him by making it to the end of the war alive. His whole life has been about all the lessons he learned. God said not to do battle not to wage war on the sins of man. If he drops it, shoot him. But to forgive them, love thine enemy. Forgiveness must be complete. And that's what I do. Instead of hating them, I pray for them. That's the secret of life. All right, so that clip, uh, it was about a movie that uh, was called Unbroken. And so after a near-fatal plane crash, there was this Olympian, uh, Louis Zamperini. Uh, and uh, he was fighting in World War II after uh, being just a great Olympic runner. And he spent 47 days in a life raft with uh, the other survivors uh, from the plane crash. But then they're rescued, so to speak, but they're rescued by the Japanese. So they become prisoners of war. And they're held there um, for the duration of the war. They are uh, beaten and abused. And Louis, um, apparently one of the Japanese officers, recognized him as an Olympic champion and just really didn't like him. And so he oversees Louis getting beaten nearly to death several times, very, very poorly treated. And uh, at the end of the movie, we get to see Louis meeting this Japanese officer 20, 30 some years after the war, and he forgives him. So I hope you got a little bit of that from the video clip. But the big question that I wanted to ask is, 
how was Louis able to forgive the Japanese for what they did to not only him, but him and his fellow soldiers in the war? Think about that for a minute. I mean, would you be able to forgive somebody after torturing you and abusing you and then watching them do it to your friends? I'd like to say that I could, but I, I really don't know until I'm in that situation. The other question is, how do our selfish choices hurt others? So I would encourage you, jot these answers down because hopefully you'll be able to talk about them in your small group uh, when you get to that. So how could Louis forgive the Japanese? And then how do our selfish choices hurt others? I mean, is it sometimes too late to make amends for the wrong things that we've done? Is it ever too late to say, I'm sorry? Why do you think it is or why do you think it isn't? I mean, we've all done things wrong, okay? And a lot of us have done things that we come to regret later. And, you know, sometimes the, the damage is so much greater than we ever imagined. That's why God set up the universe with certain rules. Not because he doesn't want us to have fun, but he set them up for our protection, so I want to share a story from my friend Greg, Greg Steer. No, he's not related to me. We kind of check that out. Um, but Greg Steer's book, um, it's called Your Next. And he shares a bunch of great stories from his life. I believe you guys have already heard a couple of those stories. So Greg goes on. He says, soon after the baseball bat incident, soon after that episode that would scar me for life, there was another day at my grandmother's house, and we were playing inside, and one of my grandma's cardinal rules was no running in the house. So with a little plastic gun, I was shooting all the imaginary bad guys hidden all over my grandparents' old 19th century house. Heading down the hallway to escape the bad guys, I broke, in, I broke the no running rule. I was moving straight for a window, but I planned to make a hard right turn into the kitchen. But at exactly the wrong moment, my grandma, she yelled, Greg, no running in the house. I turned my head to look at her, but my body kept running straight. With a gigantic crash, I penetrated the glass and landed right in the middle of the windowsill. My six-year-old body was dangling in limbo. My head and my arms, my upper torso were outside, and my feet and my legs and my lower, lower torso were still inside. My hands and fingers had been shredded by the shards of glass. Worse, my wrists had been slit by the glass and I was bleeding bad. My grandma was so nervous that she couldn't find the keyhole for the ignition, but just then a stranger appeared and he took us to the hospital to get us help. It took over three hours for me to get stitched up and checked out completely, and the stranger waited patiently and then drove us all back to my grandmother's house he said goodbye, and he left. So what do you think? Was the no running in the house rule designed to keep Greg from having fun? Is that why our parents have rules or our grandparents have rules like that? Because they just want to be fun police? Another question for you is, do you think that Greg had regrets about breaking the no running rule? Remember why and why not and be able to answer that with these questions, even if you're just writing them down for yourself. If you were Greg's grandma, what would you have said to Greg when you got back from the hospital, when things calmed down? See, Greg's incident with the shattered glass taught him an unforgettable lesson about why his grandma had rules in her house. And it also connects with a deeper spiritual truth about why God set up rules in the universe and what happens when we break them. So we're going to take a look in the Bible, where else, right, to, to take a deeper look about this whole subject of rules. So if you don't have your Bible, put me on pause, go grab your Bible, and next week make sure you have your Bible with you for this portion of the teaching time. Also, make sure you have your catechisms with you because we're going to be tapping into those as well. So catechism, voila, all right, and your Bible. So I think you know what your Bible looks like. If not, I'm really scared right now. So I'm assuming you paused me, you restarted me, and you're ready to, to read. And so I'm going to have you look up Ephesians chapter 2. 
All right, Ephesians chapter 2, and we're going to read verses 1 and 3, and then keep your finger there because we're going to come back to it. So read along with me. Once you were dead because of your obedience and your many sins. You used to live in sin just like the rest of the world, obeying the devil, the commander of the powers of the unseen world. He is the spirit at work in the hearts of those who refuse to obey God. All of us used to live that way, following the passionate desire and inclinations of our sinful nature. But our, by our very nature, we were subject to God's anger, just like everybody else. Now, Paul is writing this to the church in Ephesus, all right, to the Christians there. And he's explaining how God set up the universe in terms of rules or laws and consequences or cause and effect, if you will. Let's talk about this in just a little bit more detail. First of all, the word for sin that is used in the original Greek, the language that the New Testament was written in, is homar, which means to miss the mark. It was used in archery contests to describe when a shooter missed the target. Each shooter had a person standing by to see where the arrow went, and if the shooter missed, he would call out, Hamar, you missed the target, you missed the mark. Hopefully they didn't hit you when they missed the mark, right? I mean, not a job I really would have wanted. So it's not about hitting the bullseye. It's whether you graze the edge of the target or you shoot yourself in the foot or the guy who's watching the target. Maybe you shoot them in the arm. Regardless, if you miss the target, you have sinned. Now, maybe some of you will remember this from Pastor Kurt and I teaching you in your first communion class. See, we're not talking about hitting the bullseye every time. It's simply about staying on target, right? I mean, the targets are huge. The bullseye is like really super small. For example, maybe God gives you the amazing gift of gab, and you know how to talk to people. You can use that gift in a lot of different ways. It would be missing the mark if you use your good communication skills to tell little white lies. Just because you're good at it doesn't make it right. It would be grazing the target, right? Now, if you use that same gift to bully someone or to make fun of someone, that's like shooting yourself in the foot. It does a whole lot more damage to your reputation and to others and how people see you and, and how the person that you bullied reacts. Either way, whether you shoot yourself in the foot and do real harm to yourself or, to, or, or, or you just miss the mark, you've sinned. You've missed the target. See, a sin is a sin is a sin is a sin. Just like a miss is a miss is a miss. Either you hit it or you miss it. There is no in-between. Did you see the air quotes when I said little white lies? A lie is a lie is a lie. An untruth, a partial truth, it doesn't matter what color you assign to it. But here's the good news. God has given you a huge target. There are so many ways to use that gift of gab in powerful and amazing ways. It's not about making the most of it every time. It's about in every moment that you open your mouth to say somewhere on the target. You're going you're gonna to miss on occasion, all right? And sometimes you're going to get closer to the bullseye than the others. But it's, it's about making the best of it, the most of it. Use your gift to bring people together. To bring people closer to Jesus, not to tear them apart, not to separate them. Build people up. Don't tear them down. So what are sins? Well, sins happen when we do or say or think something wrong. Underneath it all, sin comes from not trusting and obeying God with the gifts that he has given you. Now, if you think I'm being a little too harsh when I say when you think something wrong, check out Jesus' Sermon on the Mount. All right, That's where he says, if you hate your brother in your heart, you've murdered him. That's where he says, if you look at a, 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 another boy or a girl, a man or a woman with lust in your heart, it's just as bad as if you have committed that act in reality. All right? So it's not me. I'm just telling you what Jesus has to say here. Now, the reason why God uses this word raka is because it's a picture of what sin is. God sets up this target for us to aim our lives towards. And that target is summed up 
in the Ten Commandments. As you know, we've all missed the mark by a mile, even, even me, even as your pastor. Which is why the passage that we read, read explains that we followed our sinful desires and we were subject to God's anger. Take out your catechisms, all right? Take these out, open it up to page 6, and I want you to review the Ten Commandments. I want you to read them out loud. That's what we're going to do in class. All right, we're going to have people just read through them, read each one of them out loud, and we're even going to read the what does it mean. So the introduction is, I am the Lord your God. The first commandment, you shall have no other gods before me. What does this mean? So the commandment is, you shall have no other gods. Then Martin Luther writes a description. That's what the what does this mean part. That's Luther's words. He's trying to help explain the commandment. Okay, some of them are pretty straightforward. Some of them get a little tricky. So I want you to read all of that. Go over it. Read it out loud. I know it may feel weird, but I mean, I didn't just sit down and record this with you. I actually went over this out loud several times. So, so the what does this mean? It means we should fear, love, and trust God above all things. So, so go through all of that. So go ahead, pause me right now. Just kidding. Um, maybe you unpaused me and thought something was wrong. So hopefully you've gone and you've read through those Ten Commandments and, and you've done them out loud. Maybe you've got somebody else there who you can do them with. All right. So how are the Ten Commandments rules that are designed to protect us. Think about this. Write it down. Maybe even write down some examples for a couple of the different commandments. All right? They're not about taking your joy out of life. They're actually about making sure you get the most in life. Think about it. Thou shall not steal. All right? If we didn't have that as a rule in our society and in, in the Ten Commandments, then we could just go around taking what we wanted from other people, and then when you had really nice stuff, you wouldn't have to just worry about locking it up and keeping an eye on it. I mean, people are going to take it away, right? So in light of the Ten Commandments, how do our sinful desires, those desires that uh, Paul talked about in uh, the letter to Ephesians, how do those sinful desires get us in trouble? Okay. Maybe it's that coveting stuff. You know, ninth and 10th commandment, we kind of break that. You know, it's wanting other people's stuff or wanting their relationship. Okay? You ever been jealous of a friend that had a boyfriend or a girlfriend and you're like, oh, I really want them. And you started thinking about ways that you can make their relationship break up so you can get them. I mean, that's really bad. All right? You should be happy if they're in a healthy relationship and they're allowed to date. You should be happy for them. You should be happy that people have friends. You shouldn't be looking for ways to break them up. And then the last thing, the last question for this section is, why does sin make God angry? Hmm. The bottom line with sin is that when we miss the mark, we mess up not only our lives, but we can potentially mess up the lives of people around us. We bring death and destruction into our relationships with each other. Sin isn't just a little mistake. It can be a deadly killer. And that's why God set these rules, these guidelines, because he loves us too much to let us just crash through the shattered glass of a sinful life. So since God set up the universe this way, is it ever possible to break the rules and get away with it? What do, you think? do you think we can, we can sin, we can, we can break the Ten Commandments, we can do things against God and he'll never know? Maybe you noticed that in that first reading from Ephesians, Paul used the past tense, used to live that way. We were, we were past tense, subject to God's wrath. The next two verses tell us why. Remember I said keep your finger there in Ephesians? Verses 4 and 5. But God is so rich in mercy, and he loved us so much, that even though we were dead because of our sins, he gave us life when he raised Christ from the dead. It's not only by God, it's only, excuse me, it's only by God's grace that you are saved. 
Now, one of the things some people have a hard time with, they're like, I wasn't dead. I'm still walking around as happy as a clam. I, I Some of the sins I did were kind of, you know, enjoyable. When the Bible uses the term death or dead, there are two. There's the physical death and the spiritual death. So you can be physically alive and be spiritually dead. And the really cool thing is, as a Christian, when you physically die, if Jesus is your Lord and Savior, you are still spiritually alive. So we can live forever. So now is this starting to make a little more sense? So the great news is that even though we've all missed the mark, we've all messed up in our lives, when a person trusts Christ as his only hope for salvation, God forgives us and helps us to defeat the desires that we have to, quote unquote, break the rules, to go against how he wants us to live. So what is trust then? Well, trust is having exactly what is offered to us. It's must, much more than just believing that God exists, but it's trusting that he will, what he says will happen will actually happen. When you read the Bible or you hear the Bible, trust what God says applies to you, and that will happen. When God says you are forgiven, if you confess with your mouth, if you, you, know, if, if you tell him these things, you are forgiven. That's exactly what you are. You have that forgiveness when you trust in him for that forgiveness. What other option do we really have? I mean, can we do this whole thing on our own? No, there's not enough good for us to do to outweigh the bad. and That's not how it works. There's not some cosmic scale. Jesus paid the price for all of us, and we just need to accept it so that he can wipe out all of our debts. He can forgive us, and then we can be with him in heaven one day when he comes back or when we die. And... I want to go back to Greg's story just for a minute. Greg's got these scars. I, I've seen them. Uh, I don't know if you'll ever get a chance to meet him or see him on any videos or anything, but he's got these scars on his wrist from when he got cut, got cut up through the glass. His fingers are a little bit mangled, but sometimes I tease him. I think that's maybe from when he hit his hand with a hammer when he was a carpenter. So, yeah, Greg was actually, uh, he, he did roofs. So, um, But just like Greg, we, we, we carry scars from our sins. But our relationship with God is restored. But even though that's restored and he removes the eternal consequence of the sin, which unrepented sin, if we never accept Jesus, is spending an eternity in hell, right? The only sin you can't be forgiven for is the one you don't confess. That's why if you paid attention in church, when we do a time of confession together, you know, we say, forgive me for the things that I know, forgive me for the things that I, I can't think about, the things I've forgotten, things I've done, and the things that I've failed to do, because there's sins of omission as well as commission. So you, you, uh, you steal something that's a sin that you committed, okay, but if you don't help somebody and you had the means to do it, that's also a sin. So, I mean, see how this is getting really, really tricky? You know, you think you're a good person, maybe, but it's not about being good, is it? It's about being in a relationship with Jesus. So, And that's the good news. When we trust Christ, we are forgiven for all the wrong things that we've done. I want to show you something here. I brought a hammer, a board, and um, some nails. All right, so I'm going to turn the camera down. All right, I'm still here, but I want you to see this piece of wood, okay? So this piece of wood represents our lives. And this nail, there we go, yeah. That represents sin, okay? And so we've got this clean state, and every time we sin, we kind of put these nails into our lives. All right? Yeah, that one kind of bounced out. That wasn't supposed to happen. I'll just bounce that one back in there. So, so that's kind of what happens in our lives, okay? Now, this is the sin, but then when we pull these things out, all right, and by accepting Jesus, you can't do it on your own. Jesus is the one that pulls these out. So the sin is gone, right? But look at this board. You see that? The holes, the consequences of the sin are still there. So Jesus took away the eternal consequences. He took away the sin, but maybe it damaged your relationship with somebody or you physically hurt yourself or somebody else. 
or maybe you even have to go to jail because you you know broke a law of the country as well as sin. So I just I wanted you guys to get that illustration because sin is a big deal. And even though Jesus has promised to forgive us and that forgiveness comes at such a high price, it's free to us just for the asking. But it's still a big deal because it has implications in this world here and now. I got a challenge for you. My challenge for you is to memorize the Ten Commandments. Okay? Don't worry about the, the, the what does this mean Luther part right now. Just memorize the Ten Commandments. And um, next week, um, whether it's in your faith group or in, in another group with Brian, um, we're going to ask you if you can recite those. All right? And there might be a prize for anybody that can. I don't know. That'll be up to Brian. It was so good to be with you guys. Um, I missed uh, hanging out with you uh, this last uh, little bit. So I'm glad you're here and hope you have a great small group. Talk to you later.